Bar is called to order. The Pledge of Allegiance, please. Thank you. Um, the next item is approval of minutes. Do we have uh, approve, any approve. second? We have a motion second. No additions, deletions, or corrections. If not, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Uh, public input. Anyone in the public would like to speak today? Seeing none, I'll move to streetcar system performance report. Mr. Allen. Good afternoon, Brian Allen, director of Streetcar. Uh, for April, we had 3,735 trips. Uh, we missed 28.75 of those, mostly because of uh, employee uh, operator shortage. Hmm. Uh, our on-time performance for the month was 99.91. Uh, we had no reported accidents for April. Uh, unfortunately, that ended this afternoon when we hit a <coughs> pedestrian at Centro. Ooh. Um, she is. She was taken to the Tampa General with non-life-threatening injuries. What happened? Did she just step out in front of it? Correct. No. Brilliant. Thank you. So, um, and as far as special service goes, we did almost 26 hours of extra service for Emily Arena. Our ridership for the month was 79,179 compared to 24,308 <laughs> last year. Um, and of those, 125 were wheelchairs. So that, both numbers continue to climb for us. Um, we have a new motorman class starting next Monday. Where we'll have four new motormen. That should alleviate our shortage of what we have. And the only other thing I have as far as infrastructure, which I'll have more to report on at the July meeting, is that uh, we're going to be doing a major tie replacement program on our ballasted track out there and we're doing this with a FTA surface transportation block grant we received. Uh, working in conjunction with the city who actually owns the tracks? Correct. Yeah. yeah. That's good news. Great. Anybody have any questions? Uh, seeing none, thank you, Brian. <coughs> Legal and legislative report. Mr. Yes. Matthews? Good afternoon. I've got one item today and that's to recommend that we add the city of Tampa and Hart to our general liability insurance policy. Um, that's the policy with preferred governmental insurance trust. Um, it provides coverage for bodily injury, property damage, um, personal injury, and advertising injury, and it also provides coverage for, you know, mm -hmm. um, it basically covers personal injury caused by an offense arising out of the business. Um, and to provide background as to the recommendation, um, the interlocal agreement between the city and Hart, which contemplated the creation of THS, uh, included a provision that required um, that tri-party agreement, which would be subsequently enacted, to include a provision that would require THS to name the city and heart as additional insureds. Mm -hmm. um, the tri-party agreement uh, didn't include such a provision, but it did incorporate the interlocal agreement such that it's still sufficient to sure. include that provision. Um, and you know, if you go back and look at the agreements, it seems that the intent of the three parties when coming to these agreements and contemplated that they wanted the heart and, to, and the city to be additional insurance to their liability policies. Sure, even though they automatically were, they want to be named. Correct. And the city asked, I believe, is that correct? Yes, Hart and the city contacted me. Um, there, there is a, the lawsuit that's currently underway, uh, the Judy Harvard lawsuit. I think they filed a claim um, on that uh, claim, um, and they, they've denied tender. Um, so this issue obviously arose, and they said, hey, you know, we looked at the policies, and we're not an additional insured, um, and, and requested to be named. Sure. Um, so, um, and that's, that's what really brought this up. And we reviewed the documents and we, we agree and feel comfortable with naming them. Okay, good. So we want to recommend to add them as additional insurance to the policy. Do we Excellent. need you need a motion? I I'll, I'll make a motion to that effect. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say nay. That's it? That's it all I got. Good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, presentation on Envision Tampa Streetcar. I don't see Mr. Shoecraft, so we'll pass over that for the moment. Uh, he's already a little bit late, but that's all right. <laughs> uh, let's move to chair's report. I really don't have one that I can think of. So let's move to the CEO's report. Mr. Limmer. 
I don't have much other than um, earlier this month I did uh, get the chance to go meet our delegation in Washington, D.C. talked about a lot of things related to public transportation, surface transportation reauthorization, the infrastructure package, all kinds of things. But one um, particular element uh, relevant to this group is we talked a lot about the capital investment grant program that the Federal Transit Administration oversees. That's the big program to where you can um, expand uh, rail systems. Mm -hmm. um, every, pretty much every rail system in the country utilizes those federal funds. And uh, talked a lot about the streetcar expansion project and where it was in the process to um, expand further north. So um, the program itself is very healthy. It's got you know bipartisan support, good financial support, and um, both, especially the DOT is very much looking forward to us advancing the streetcar. Um, expansion efforts in partnership with the city. So sure. Mr. Shoecraft shows up, he'll be able to get into the details on exactly where they are. Good. But from a federal delegation level, there was a lot of support there. So that concludes my report. I have a question, Mr. Chairman. Sure. Um, and this is, this is, I guess, sort of a joint heart and city question. I was actually gonna ask Steve, but maybe better to ask the representatives of Heart in the City. The, w one of the alternatives that were proposed for the streetcar including, included double tracking the system all the way from inception at Ebor all the way into the extension and up through the, the new terminus in Tampa Heights. The current proposal only shows the double tracking north of Whiting Street. Um, now that we have the referendum money, has there been any consideration for going back and looking at double tracking the original section of the streetcar? I mean, I'm assuming that was dropped because of the expense involved, and now there's a possibility that there could be money available. I don't think David, I don't think it was solely dollars. I yeah. think it was the fact it was intrusion into right of way. Uh -huh. right? You got Water Street, which you'd be taking out a large chunk of to put uh -huh. another track in, and then um, Florida Avenue. So I, I can check, but I uh -huh. don't think it was solely a monetary issue. Okay. Yeah. yeah and, um, you can often run into unanticipated utility conflicts as well, but um, Mr. Shoecraft is here, so perhaps we could get into that as part <laughs> of his presentation. Um, but more generally, now that the all for transportation tax did pass and does exist, assuming it um, is available uh, next year, I think it, it could raise a more general question about what is the next step and then the next step after that, um, right. I think is certainly on the table, so. Sure. Well, the, the lawsuit is still continuing. That yes. That has not been satisfied, so to say next year, hopefully next year. Yeah, right. Because they can continue to stall that. Um, before we get to Mr. Shoecraft, uh, is there any Vector Media sales activity report today? Looks like she's trying to get in. Oh, she is. <laughs> Ready for you. <laughs> Come on in. You are. Yes. Good afternoon. Hi. Hello, thank you. That's uh, Lori Gage, Vector Media. And um, I had uh, some interesting um, ideas come across my desk yesterday for Grow Financial. So um, I'll be sharing some of their concepts as we get them. They want to do some interesting things on 
some of the station shelters, etc. cetera. Um, so at any rate, I didn't get enough information to get it sent out to you before this meeting today. Um, but we continue to have solid numbers through the end of the year. Um, we might get HCC coming back uh, with some more dollars before the year is over. Um, and that's really about all that I have. Are there any questions or I don't changes? think so. I don't believe so, but thank you for coming and thanks for the report. Absolutely. Um, we did raise the rates a bit, so everybody that is going under contract, um, you know, we're getting a little bit more revenue. Was that on the basis of increased ridership? Yes, absolutely. Good. That's yeah. great. Any other questions? Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Shoecraft, I think we're ready for you. Thank you. My apologies if I delayed the meeting. You have it. Hustling over here. So. I think you're the last guy on the agenda. <laughs> um, so my name is Steve Shoecraft. I'm uh, uh, with HDR. We're the uh, project managers for the campus streetcar uh, modernization and extension study. Uh, we put together a, um, a quick presentation, sort of run through the status of the project, and then um, we can answer detailed questions about sure. a variety of topics. Um, this is, again, a fairly high-level presentation. I've, we've seen some of these slides before. Um, this is, we kicked this process off about two years ago now. Um, we've been looking at, initially it was high-level decisions about what's the purpose and need for the potential investment in streetcar, what are potential routes and corridors for an extension, um, and then we've been sort of honing in on a more precise extension, corridor, and guideway, as well as the modernization improvements to run modern streetcar vehicles across the system. Um, the, the, this is, project has been paid for, the study by DOT and City of Tampa, We've been coordinating closely with HART through that entire effort. Uh, we've got a broad team of folks with streetcar experience and transit experience from around the country, locally and around the country, supporting us on the work, including several of our technical consultants who were recently more engaged in moving the project forward in to sort of gear up for preliminary design as the next step. Um, through the process, we've been tracking carefully um, a lot of the development uh, and investment activities that, that's occurred downtown. So this is not new information for any of you. I won't spend a lot of time on it, but if you roll down to the bottom uh, item, there's $6 billion of potential investment in the pipeline, and most of those projects are underway at some level or another. So when we talked about this two years ago, there wasn't a lot of dirt being turned. There was a lot of discussion about the projects. Water Street, for example, wasn't named yet at the time. We were still calling it, um, I can't remember what we called it, that big development site, I think was the general terminology. Um, so now those projects are very well defined and underway and are starting to really change the way people visit and access destinations and circulate around downtown. And we're seeing that reflected directly in um, streetcars use now with free fare and extended service and, and tighter headways. We're seeing that activity translate directly into um, demand for the existing service. So since the beginning, we were challenged early by the now previous mayor, Buckhorn, um, to get out early in the project and get people engaged in thinking about what the future of streetcar could mean for the city. So we have had a series of large scale public workshops and also um, dozens upon dozens of briefings and work sessions um, and check-ins with different organizations um, throughout the broader definition of what downtown Tampa is. Our last workshop, we presented our recommendations for the um, what's really fundamentally the locally preferred alternative, the guideway, the ex extent of the extension, the guideway within street segments, um, station locations, and vehicle technology. Um, we, most of the discussion that occurred then was about more about what's next. How can it go further? What else can it do for the city? Um, but we're also moving into a point in the process where we're actually getting more very detailed sort of micro block by block level comments about affecting parking, about affecting trees, about impacting bike lanes. So those are sort of the stages that we're going through in the process. It was high level. Early, we're gonna get closer and closer into those more um, neighborhood district block, kind of block by block yeah. sessions. 
so what we've gone through in that effort, so um, wrapping up in the last couple months is a decision about vehicle technology, about the alignment and guideway, stop locations and designs, and the modernization improvements. So for the vehicle technology, we completed an evaluation of replica streetcar, premium bus, and modern streetcar. We compared those operations across the full system, so what would it take to upgrade the existing line and serve the extension with one technology. So we're not talking about shifting vehicles across uh, the system. It's one, a one-seat trip from Edward City through downtown north of Tampa Heights. Uh, we focused on, um, obviously, vehicle operations and costs. Costs are a big factor. Streetcar is the most expensive of the technologies available. But it offers some pretty powerful benefits to the city. Um, it's much more accessible than the replica vehicles. Um, it has more significant potential to affect property values and economic development broadly across downtown. And it's got the ability, the capacity, that can really move traffic in exclusive guideway, uh, move travelers using the exclusive guideway service more efficiently and effectively than the other two technologies. So that sort of peak, um, peak capacity question is one of the things that we included in the evaluation. So this, the, we've talked through this a lot before. The notion of the service broadly is it's one seat trip from end to end that we have a high capacity vehicle service so we can serve those peak periods effectively. Um, that it's full day service and frequent service so we're developing the operations plan around uh, 10 minute headways through most of the course of the day. Um, quality stops with level boarding so this is Part of the accessibility question that you don't get with the replica vehicles is this would be um, low platform vehicles um, for level boarding with broad doors so you can board ingress and egress the vehicles quickly. You can bring in bikes and strollers and wheelchairs without having to do any complicated uh, mechanical deployment of the ramp or other things. Um, when we've looked at the guideway, we've looked at um, a couple thoughts about it. One is that this, the guideway itself could support other vehicle technologies. So the guideway and the stops are designed to allow for local bus service, uh, local bus operations to share that stop. And in the future, autonomous vehicles and other shuttles could use the guideway and also use the same stop location. So that's just a matter of having a portion of the stop, and I'll talk about it in a little bit, as a high platform and then a medium platform so you can serve different technologies in the same footprint. Hmm. Um, we've looked at the exclusive guideway operations Something, a lot of that has to do with maximizing travel time reliability in the system, but it's also avoiding impacts associated with um, other moving vehicles, but also parking and driveway accessibility and other issues. So we've thought about the guideway to minimize all those potential conflicts that could slow service down. And one of the challenges in the articles that have been out recently about um, systems like Miami and DC is that their portions of them are outboard of on-street parking. So if a car is parked slightly off kilter in that parking lane, the vehicle has to stop and wait for that car to move. So we're avoiding that conflict with exclusive guideway and curb running service rather than putting an outboard of on-street parking. Um, we're looking at minimizing the effects on roadway capacity, minimizing parking impacts, and minimizing impacts on sidewalks and public spaces with the uh, stop locations as we've thought about it. So the discussion was really around um, or the assessment was exclusive transit lane operations versus shared lane. We favored and accomplished to the greatest extent that we can without more significant changes to the roadway system, um, exclusive transit lane operations through most of the process, most of the project extension. And this is a little tough to see, but um, the guideway shifts within rights of way for different reasons. And we have several different conditions when we think about the downtown street network on, um, on Florida and Tampa. So the favored route is northbound on Florida, turn on Palm, and southbound on Tampa. We have some tricky turns to get back connected to the system, and you can see that at the south end of this diagram, how that works. Could, um, could, could, you, could you just elaborate on the reason why it does, doesn't all line up at Whiting Street, you've got that jog further south there? Yeah, one of the challenges of Whiting Street is the, is the positioning um, of the stop and that turn to get underneath the garage, and then you've got the garage access, ingress-egress conflict points underneath the garage. Okay. So we pulled it back 
uh, to Boreen. The city's actually looking at potential reconfigurations of Boreen um, that could provide for two-way service there, but we could run in an exclusive lane along the north side just south of Camels where the drop-off is. We would run there and then turn and queue up into the guideway on Florida. Mm -hmm. does, does that configuration allow for a, 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 an exclusive circuit that would run from Broreen up to Tampa Heights and back, just uh, an independent circuit from the rest of the of line into Oh, Newport. if it were just to circle back and then you'd have a, another. Um, yeah, there's there's ways you could do it. It's not a, the way that it's laid out now, you would backtrack a little bit and then come north. If you wanted to run a loop like that. Um, but the track work would, would be designed to permit that. You would get down there, you'd actually go down, you know, underneath the, where the tracks go underneath the cross town. Mm -hmm. You would cycle down through there and then you would come back north. So okay, southbound, well, you'd come down Franklin. I mean, will the allow, uh, design allow for that? It would allow for that. That's not currently what we have in the operations okay. plan. We have a full route running end to end, okay. not a limited service anywhere in the middle. Yeah. I mean, but if there was a special event service and you cut both ends off, so you ran it from downtown to Ebor and then you ran it from the south end of the quarter north, you could do that for special events just to flush people out. Okay. But with the operations plan that we have is now not that um, fine grained. Okay. But it would be a possibility. So what the system does, if you, if I'll try to walk through it without getting deep in the weeds and I can answer questions. If you think about Florida Avenue next to Camel as you're going northbound. The streetcar would run on the left-hand side of the road in the curb lane. There'd be a raised barrier, and then outboard of that would be parking or left turn lanes or the stop locations. So that top graphic, number one, shows that condition. And it, the scale of that exclusive lane and barrier, raised barrier, is kind of like what exists on Jackson. So the Jackson cycle track is about the width <coughs> of the, what we need for the streetcar guideway and the barrier would be variable width depending on parking or not parking on the outside of it, but that's the same kind of condition. When we go north on Florida, um, the stops will be on islands to the right side of the vehicle. And if you think about a regular city bus, all, this, all the doors are on the right side of the vehicle. So you can have right side stops for streetcar and right side stops for other transit vehicles. And then when the grid shifts and goes north, it gets substantially narrower. So if you see that section number two, is the grid from um, what's my cross street up there? Where the where the grid turns and heads due north. Um, so that's right at is it Harrison. Uh, yeah, somewhere in there. Um, it's it's substantially narrow. So when it would, curves. Yeah, yeah, where it curves, right? So it narrows down tightly to about thirty-five foot curve curve. So that doesn't allow us to um, run exclusive guideway in that section up the palm. So we would move stop cars have a phase for the streetcar move to the right side of the street and then go up the right side of the street up to Palm Avenue. Whoa. And that would give us a right side stop at Marion Transit Center so folks wouldn't have to cross the street and then a right side stop at 7th mm -hmm. and then we would turn uh, at Palm. Interesting. So if there was a future project that resulted in a lane elimination, that could be converted to exclusive guideway. But right now, without the lane elimination, we would run it in mixed traffic for that stretch. So with signal timing advantages, staying out of the left turn queue to K to get on 275 to go to West Shore, we're staying away from those congestion points, and the right side is sort of is the safest place to do that. So it serves us in providing direct access to Marion Transit Center, almost direct access mm -hmm. to Marion Transit Center, and gets us away from the big left, the heavy left, the 275. So at Palm, we would turn at Palm, um, go across Palm in front of the YMCA, and then run south on Tampa, so we'd be in mixed traffic along Palm, and then heading south on Tampa, we would be in an exclusive guideway. And so the same, looks like the same section as the Florida section. It's running on the left, head, looking south, it's running on the left-hand side of the road with the stops in that island condition. Um, also to allow for right side stops for other transit vehicles. And that continues down through the core of downtown um, to just south of Kennedy. At Kennedy, we hit that left turn queue for Jackson, which is probably the most congested intersection downtown. Um, 
and we would stay in um, we wouldn't stay in the furthest left lane we would stay in the left what's the left in the through lane continue through there that puts us out out board of the Hyatt drop-off which was recently approved and it gets us uh, it allows us to swing wide to go on waiting to connect to Franklin the mm -hmm. existing line so that's the project that we're taking into um, more detailed evaluation and that's the, the guideway is the basis for our evaluation for the uh, environmental impacts the stop locations are positioned to provide um, to, to serve downtown with an easy walking distance of virtually all of downtown so the spacing um, is consistent with the more developed sections of the existing system about every four blocks they're um, somewhat constrained by major driveway and parking garage access points we can't block those with a stop obviously so we're avoiding some of those conflicts uh, and we have those positioned and our plan now is to take some alternative locations through the NEPA process in case we have issues as we move into design, we have a fallback position for our stop location. Um, as I mentioned, the stops um, would be designed, if, if you think of this image as um, Florida Avenue looking north, the streetcar guideway is on the left-hand side, the stop is in that, the right-hand side of the vehicle or the guideway, and that stop location would switch out. It would be parking on blocks where you don't have a stop, and it would be a this sort of platform stop condition in places where um, in places where we need that need the location. The one of the advantages of these island stops is that we're not eating up sidewalk space. And on a lot of Florida, we only have you know ideally, I think we'd have eight to ten feet. In some cases, we have six to seven to eight feet, and that's not enough room for a stop with clear sidewalk condition. So the island stops also help us limit impact when we're in the core downtown. The scale of these, it, it, we've, we've, we're calling them stops instead of stations because they're fairly light footprint interventions in downtown. These aren't large dramatic structures with a lot of equipment associated with them. These are pretty, um, pretty small footprint, pretty lightweight. The pictures on the right-hand side of this image are from Kansas City, and we're thinking a similar scale of a shelter. And you can see that that's a fairly, um, fairly modest intervention in the city. For the modernization improvements to run the modern vehicles on the existing line, we've got to make a series of improvements. Um, the first set that we have highlighted here is the guideway reconstruction. There are several turns that are too tight. There are 50 foot radius and 55 foot radius turns. We need to push up to 60 foot radius turns. Um, they're with the hatch circle, so down at um, Channel Side Drive and the Water Street, um, coming into, heading northbound, coming into the traffic circle. We need to smooth that out a little bit. The city's actually setting in their work on Channel Side Drive. They're giving us the real estate we need to do that without impacting any improvements. Um, we need to, to smooth out the tracks really modestly at the CSX crossing and then at 8th Street, um, just north of here. And then the second major improvement is obviously the stops. Um, we need to upgrade the existing stops with a high platform condition. So the existing stops now have the ramp and the high block with the steel plate that deploys for handicap accessibility. Um, we would remove the ramp and the high block, we reconstruct the center portion of that platform to be a higher platform height for level boarding. Um, but we can do that all within the existing footprints of those stops. They're fairly large stops scale-wise because they're designed to have the vehicle at one end or the other to line up with the high block. And we don't need to favor one end or the other. We could line up directly across the center of the stop. Um, we, for, the, for those existing stops, again, the improvements that we would need to do would be, the project would be within the footprint of the existing stop. No additional impacts in Newport City related to those stop conditions. And we could reuse either remove and replace those shelters or replace them in kind with new shelters. So we're not looking at changing, the, there's no particular need to change the character of those shelters. And that was part of the agreement uh, with the Barry Latino Commission at the time previously, that those would be more contextual and designed than what happened outside of the historic district. And then the, the third piece of that is this building. Um, we've got a team of architects um, that have looked at reconfiguration of the 
track the, the track in the yard and the facility to support a larger vehicle. For the sake of design now, we've used one of the larger vehicles that's on the market to test fit, um, and we can fit a new fleet of vehicles on this property without looking for another site. Okay. The, and it looks like, it, the way we've looked at it is we've tried to maximize um, the use of the existing building, building and yard without going north to 7th Avenue. But if you did go north to 7th Avenue, you could add even um, six to eight additional vehicles on the north side of the site and reconfigure the entrance to the building. And then you've got this project as well as potential extensions and you don't have to look for this property. And then the traction power, um, most of the system can be reused as is. The poles, the wires, we have to change the contact wire to run the um, hand graph um, in the modern vehicle, but it's, that's not a significant cost in the process. Um, so we are now in this process where we're trying to wrap up the technical work that defines the project. We're now working on updated cost estimates and ridership estimates, um, working through the environmental impact process. So we've gotten, we've been coordinating with FTA about the nature of that analysis that's required and some of that's underway now. Uh, and we've started conversations between the city and heart about funding and implementation. So we're looking at the governance structure, um, funding and finance, what pots money, who's, you know, who's going to take on what share of the project, and they're very early discussions, um, and then a more careful implementation schedule. So Ben has been, our, you know, in our very first conversation was, let's be really careful about the schedule, let's not uh, be too aggressive about expectations, um, and that we're working through that process now. So we're publishing pretty broad dates now about potential start of service because we need to work through the next couple months um, that are really focused on implementation strategy. And that's that's what I got. Questions? That was good. Dave, you want to ask your same question? Yeah, the, Steve, I know originally you had looked at double tracking the system all the way back into Ebor. Was that a cost consideration to eliminate that, or was it? Were there other reasons involved in that? We, Drop dropping it. I mean. Yeah, we um, we've been holding that until this point in the study right now, and we're doing our operations plan to see if we can meet a ten-minute headway service with the larger vehicles with the existing passenger tracks, um, and it looks like we can. So, from a service standpoint, we wouldn't need to do that. Um, we could look at some additional sections where we could get benefit out of longer passive tracks, but we don't necessarily need it to hit a 10-minute headway with the modern vehicle. Okay, well that's a good answer. It's not needed. Yeah, one, with the existing system, I'm sorry, with the, um, one of the things that we've seen, and Brian's been pulling numbers for us recently about the average travel speed between stops, um, on the existing system, you have several locations where you don't cross many streets and you don't have to stop at many lights. So um, your travel speeds between stops are pretty high, and at 15-minute headways, um, we would we would think that's that's kind of setting the standard for the extension. With the extension we've got to go through the core downtown with multiple lights, even with transit signal priority. We could be delayed a little bit more downtown than on the existing line because of the because we're in the grid and it's a tight grid. Sure. Um, so even with the 15-minute headways now, um, the passing tracks aren't constrained to hit 15-minute headway, and they're not even not pushing the limit on what's possible out of the system. So some we would do in 30% design more detailed modeling um, to test that more carefully, and that feeds into the number of vehicles that we would need to acquire to support a service to deliver 10-minute headways plus spare vehicles. Um, to cover vehicles on service. How many vehicles would that have to be? Right now, and we have a draft concept of operations into the city, so it hasn't been shared broadly, but we're looking at um, at a pretty, a pretty conservative estimate of, of 10 vehicles. 10? Yeah. yeah. So seven in service, three spares, and that's a high spare ratio, so there's a lot of... We have more discussion to go through until we get that number down. I think it's between eight and ten probably is where we're going to end up. The we esti initially when we estimated for the early phase of the project we were assuming twelve. 
Um, we're always trying to hold that conservative because we don't want to. Sure. Um, we don't want to plan around a lower number and then, you know, sure. cause a problem here. Do you have a question? Anybody else have a question? Um, the current cars seat about 48 people, and then you can stand. The cars you're thinking about seat a lot more than that. Yeah, over double the. We've we're trying to be careful about that because we're not in a vehicle procurement phase now, so we're right. not picking a manufacturer. We're using um, a, one of the larger vehicles, and I think the capacity at some loading rate for the Siemens S70 short is is 140. That's a lot. Um, that's not packed. That's not jam packed. Um, but that's standing. Sure. As well as saying. Sure. Um, I can. I and I apologize. I should follow up with information on that. So in our in the alternative report, we have a comparison of the three vehicles that are uh, by America compliant that are in service now around the country, and we have a comparison of those sure. for information purposes. So you ditch double tracking just because of the of the cost, basically, and that. No, we didn't think we needed it. We don't. We didn't think we needed it. That's for great news. Ten minute headways. Now, if this, if there was an interest in going to seven minute headways or six minute headways and really push a lot of service out, then that may that be a different answer. Yeah, that may be years <laughs> down the road. So the increased ridership we're enjoying uh, for, with free fares and better headways is that going to have a big impact in DC when you're up there talking about funding? Oh, uh, yeah, it's a it's part of the. It's very. It's one of the first items on our agenda when we talk to FTA now. So we're in a cycle where we're having regular calls with FTA about the project. We've been formally, um, we're formally recognized in the as in the project development cycle, mm -hmm. and we're having coordination now related to both the environmental clearance and moving into a submittal for small starts, uh, which would be late summer, early fall timeframe. Um, it's important for us from a, it's important from a you know, proof of concept. So if we put the service out there, will people use it? And that's happening. So we have that's that a, story. But it's really important deal. from a ridership standpoint. I'll bet. So um, now we have a base of ridership history that um, gives us something that we can start to build on when we develop the stops model. Yeah, so it's actually significant. Yeah. And, the, and when we look at ridership along the same, bus ridership along the same quarters, we're not seeing the same numbers. And there's not really a bus that serves the same route no. with the same frequency. So. Now we have more of an apples to apples comparison or reference. And then the other factor that we need to look into, there's um, specific methods to look at event activity along the corridor. And we know that we're seeing um, a big uptick on ridership on Saturday and Sunday, which is more event driven and visitor driven. Um, so we need to factor that in as well. So this, for the rest of this year, you're basically gonna put your whole plan together Figuring out what funding is going to be for operations and capital, and then and then at some point you have to have a commitment from the feds and from every other f funding partner in order to go forward with full engineering and design. Is that? Yeah, the basic structure is we have to get the local story and deals put together, and then we take that to FTA and say, okay, the local the local the local funding is committed. It's not a hundred percent commit, but it's a pretty strong commitment. The governance structure is in place to deliver the project. Now we need you to come on board. That money doesn't flow right away, so it doesn't flow to the project immediately. Right. So there will be local funding to support the early phases of design. Sure. So 30% design could start probably the beginning of 2020. Um, and 30% design gets you, you know, substantially harder numbers on costs, answers other sorts of environmental and impact questions, deals with questions about utility impacts, which was brought up when I just came in. Um, we, we start to do, look at utility impacts and costs associated with relocations. Um, that happens at 30% design. So 30% design is a big, uh, you know, it's a, a big, big deal. lift. Yeah. Um, and then, then you have, then you have a project, then you start moving into um, the full, your full funding grant agreement with the FDA. Right. So there's still local, local support. It could be paid for by that grant agreement, but it, it's gotta be fronted by part of the city yeah. in advance. So, as Bob mentioned before you came, we don't really know if that money is going to flow locally or not until a court it's, it resolves the issue. Um, so, 20, so this is, this is an important year 
for, to finish the plan, figure out the funding, and then see where we are next year. Yeah, we have a really important, important three or four months ahead of us. Yeah, because we try to get that plan organized and understand who's going to kick in what share of the costs. Yeah, we have basically six months until 2020. It's yeah. great. Any other questions? I think Mike and I don't know Jeff probably can answer this better, but assuming the litigation is resolved, then the money will flow. However, it's set up in the interlocal agreement, but. Um, if it if the litigation isn't resolved, it's not going to flow at all. That's correct. You know, so um, right, which is a whole other game. I think it's being collected in escrow right now. Yeah, that's my understanding. Right. The I mean, really, in very very round numbers right now, we're you know we pull we've pulled our cost estimates live because we're working new numbers now, so we don't want people to get fixed on the number. But the local share of the project, if we assumed. Um, 40 to 50 percent is federally supported, and, and the federal money won't go for modernization; it's only for the extension. So we can only tap that for a portion of the project. Um, if we can get the half of the non-federal share from the state um, new starts program, uh, the local costs would be somewhere. And please, if there's a reporter, don't quote me. Between 50 and 75 million dollars. So that's the the local capital share. The local capital share. That's pretty high. Considering that it was so much smaller when we built the system the first time and did the extension. We'll have a better we'll have a better read on costs in the next two months. Mm -hmm. But we're careful. We've seen costs go up on other systems over the last couple of years. Well, that was my last question. You may or may not know the answer to this, but you know, Fort Lauderdale had a great streetcar system plan and it blew up completely with I don't know whether it was your firm or who, but the cost just dramatically changed, and I've never, nobody's ever explained to me why. Number one, number two, do you, do you feel like you know enough about what's going on around here so you're not going to find any major cost increases or not? I don't think there's any surprises that are locally specific or project specific, like utility impacts. Um, we sort of understand from the city what's in the street and what we're going to have to deal with, so there shouldn't be any big surprises there. Um, our Costs are going to be more associated with um, factors like steel steel costs go up and other costs go up that are hard costs that right. we don't have any influence over. Labor costs are going up now too because the economy's hot, you know. So we're we're in the middle of that yeah. ramp up in co costs overall. So what happened in Fort Lauderdale? Do you have any idea? Some of it was the project actually kind of a, the definition of the project involved from what would have been um, more of a traditional streetcar circulator to a system that would have capacity to stretch out further to go to the port and to go to the airport and elsewhere. Uh -huh. So it sort of was morphing into more of a light rail kind of service. And that was influencing some decisions about, uh, some design decisions, sure. um, the vehicle technology decisions, uh, with the notion that that could really ramp up. Now, Broward County now, with their initiative, is actually looking at a, more of a light rail project that would use some of that um, same quarter. So it's, it's, it has sort of evolved from what was going to be a purely local circulator kind of project to something that's more substantial. Sure. Well, thank you, Steve. Anyone else have any questions? Thank you so much for coming. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Uh, our agenda is pretty much done. Uh, there are financial statements in your package, marketing report. Uh, any any marketing report news? I know Ms. Brooks is no longer with us. Afternoon, Tyler Rowland, uh, manager of uh, communications and creative services. Taylor. Just a really quick brief um, marketing report for you guys. Um, and on April 21st, the streetcar increased um, its frequency to every 15 minutes. Um, in advance of that, uh, marketing and community engagement reached out and to the community and engage everybody with the coming soon campaign to make everybody aware of the upcoming changes with the new frequency. Um, we promoted that via our website, um, email, um, and our social media channels. And then we also kicked off the lifestyle campaign um, immediately after that to kind of help promote the local downtown uh, atmosphere with nightlife, um, family attractions, um, 
and people being able to utilize the streetcar for those for those uh, activities. And then we also did have another uh, streetcar live event feature, uh, featuring, sorry, I pronounced this right, Janu 6 and the Old Souls on Saturday, April 6th. Uh, so that's the Mark report. Um, any questions? I don't. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Well, I think that concludes our business then. Um, ladies and gentlemen, thank you. This meeting is adjourned. We'll see you next month. Okay. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you.